Hi, Misha here, and we end Japanese week, as it were, with a recently recorded video to kind of go with the old ones. We kind of had the middle, looking at the pistols, specifically those from the mind of Kajiro Mambu. When he was getting into gun development, he was a captain, and he would retire as a lieutenant general. And I considered very much breaking this into parts, but... There's such a continuation here of just kind of designs leading on to others. Even over here, there are connections. So we're going to talk about them. Almost all of these fire the 8x22, 8mm Nambu cartridge. Almost all. And they range from very small production to, well, what was considered quite large for Japan. And I also want to talk about kind of reforming the Japanese pistols image. I, over the years I keep doing videos, and I think it is definitely a misunderstood gun, although people are starting to starting to come around, which is which is great. I'm not saying it's an amazing gun, it's the best gun, it's better than 1911. I'm just saying it's not dog shit. <laughs> so with that, let's dive in with the earliest generations of the Nambu Automatic. Honestly, guns, they either have no name or way too many names. And again, for those of you that have kind of hung out with me this week and indulged me in my Japanese, I greatly appreciate it. If you could, do like, share, and subscribe. And if you'd like to help support the channel, check out the link to the Patreon. With that, let's dive in. So we begin with a quick look back at the time... 26 revolver, which was Japan's standard issue sidearm for the Navy and Army in the early 20th century, and would remain the standard in the Army all the way until the 1920s. However, the Navy would take a slightly different path, although it would take a little while to get there. And so we finally come to Kajiro Nambu. Talked about him a little bit in the Type 30, 35, and 38 videos. But while well, as the rifles, he led a team and was working kind of based on what Arasaka had started. The pistol was kind of his plum. Uh, Nambu was born early in the Meiji period. He would enter the uh, army and 1889, so at the same time the Murata came around, and he would be assigned as a lieutenant, and then soon captain, he would go to the Tokyo Artillery Arsenal, and quickly be put to work working with Arasaka on finalizing the Type 30. He would develop a few things, make a few contributions, such as the muzzle cover, but once Arasaka kind of moved on to other things, Nambu found himself more or less in charge of a secondary program. Kind of a, eh, it'd be nice, low priority, low funding. That was the 30th year automatic pistol program, so 1897. In, you know, design in hopes of replacing the revolver eventually. So, 1898, 1899, 1900... Many Japanese officials, including Nambu, sometimes toured around the world, including mostly Europe, looking at designs of the day. At this point, we're really pre-Luger. We're pre-most of Browning's famous designs. One of the most established military-grade self-loading pistols was the Borchard C93. Another was, the at the time, very new C96 Broomhandle Mauser. There was also the uh, Model 94 Steyr, and uh, there were a few designs from Bergman. So Nambu kind of looked at all these, and he came up with two concepts, which he would make kind of prototypes of at the Tokyo Arsenal around 1900, 1901. The, uh, the Type 1, as it was known, was kind of a take on the C96 slash Bergman to some extent. And the Type 2 was based on the C93 Borchard, sort of. But there's other elements, too. 
Both were shown off the following year, and the army really kind of took to the Type II, so the Borchardt-inspired design, and that would lead to army testing, army trials in 1904, which gets us to this gun's immediate progenitor. We're going to call this the Papanambu because its actual name is kind of murky. It has lots of them. We'll get to that in a minute. Its predecessor is called the Grandpa Nambu by collectors, and they're exceedingly rare and exceedingly expensive, and they really did not see much. They were put into production in 1903, and by 1906, the last ones were being shipped out from Tokyo. They built anywhere from 2,400 up to maybe 2,600 max. And it was an automatic pistol. Um, it fired a new 8 by 22 millimeter cartridge, bottleneck, that we call 8 millimeter Nambu. Had about a 4.7 inch barrel, same as the revolver. It's actually a little bit lighter weight than the revolver, a little under 2 pounds. Detaching 8 round magazine and um, used a short recoiling system with kind of a falling tilting wedge lockup. Now, the differences between the original Grandpa and the Papa are pretty straightforward. But uh, we'll get to that in just a minute, because I want to talk about this. The, the Army did test this in 1904, maybe in the 1905, and approved it for private purchase, the, the Grandpa, that is. But they did not adopt it. The biggest contract was to the nation of Siam, Thailand, who bought over 1,200, maybe 1,500. So the, the, the biggest and maybe so single one user of the grandpa was uh, was, Th was Thailand, uh, Siam. A few hundred were sold to um, army officers, maybe a couple to the Navy, other purchases, blah, blah, blah. Now, in 1904, Kajiro Nambu was again promoted and transferred to Kokora, or will, will, will become Kokora. But before he left the Tokyo Arsenal, he had a refined, simplified version, and that's where we get the Papa Nambu here. The transition from Grandpa to Papa make it easier to produce, more durable, more dependable, simpler to use. So, first off, the magazine. The original Grandpa had a wood base plate, looked really good not the most durable so he went to kind of a alloy base plate for the detaching eight round mag so the mag design was slightly refined now they both had the kind of browning style checkered quite large for that day mag release and checkered grips the Grandpa, most noticeably, had a stock slot in the back, which the Papa was going to have, but never did. And they actually made two different styles of stock for the Grandpa, as well as a shoulder holster from leather if you wanted to go that way. They also refined the cocking handle in the back. Interestingly, both still had the adjustable tangent rear sights. The Papa here is out to 500 meters has a grip safety in the front. Quite a bit of with the trigger group was changed. Believe it or not, as small as this seems, the Grandpa had an even smaller trigger guard. It also was less of a modular packet. So disassembly was different, more difficult, which again is a little harder to believe. With the Papa, we went to this style of guard, slightly bigger. You can see it bulges out a bit in the front. That's where they expanded it. They also went to a more squared off as opposed to more elegant hammer, uh, excuse me, trigger, kind of more, the grandpa was more rounded like on the revolver. They also reworked the recoil system, which is on uh, the side here, making it a little easier to disassemble. And they went to a moving lanyard ring in the back, whereas the Grandpa had a fixed lanyard ring. And there were a few other minor little changes besides, but though, yeah, you can see it's mostly cosmetic. This is a striker-fired gun. The uh, tail for the 
firing pin actually is side mounted, not bottom. And um, high grade, high quality blowing, nice machining, elegant gun. I'll give it that. The grip and everything might make you think Luger, and there's certainly some inspiration there. But the way it cocks, and you can see the recoil guide, a very different system. And the grip safety in the front reminds me very much of the Glacinti in Italy, although it was actually adopted later. As you see, it has a last round hold open, but it's not a device when you pull the mag out. Maybe. It goes forward, because it's just the friction there. I hate doing that a lot. I'm sure you can understand why. Striker fired gun. This one surprisingly has a solid, sturdy feeling spring in it. Still. It does point quite well, quite naturally. One thing I will note, look at my hand. That lanyard ring folding down kind of uh, gets caught in the way. So this was Nambu's first automatic pistol. And it too was tested by the Army in 1906. And again, it was approved for private purchase and carry by the officers, but it was not adopted. Nevertheless, Tokyo would keep it in production as kind of a commercial export gun. And that might have been all she wrote. A few hundred built. But in 1909, the Navy, needing a new gun, wanting to go for the automatics. You actually see a lot of navies going for automatics before the armies. Uh, po I point to the, uh, the German Navy. And also the Italian Navy purchased early automatics. Anyway, they ordered the gun here. And this is where the naming thing gets really fun. Some people call it the Nambu type pistol. It's also known as the... 1902 model 1902 for the grandpa and the 1902 modified for the papa that's fair enough the uh, the navy guns are sometimes called the type 4 or type 04 not really sure of the origin of that name aside from yeah the 1904 was the earliest testing who knows and uh quite ironically it's marked army type so oftentimes the Navy called it the Army type, even though the Army never adopted it. And the Army called it the Navy type because, quite logically, the Navy did adopt it. So it'll be called both, but not by the respective nations. These would also be purchased by Siam and a few by China. The first contract was for 1500 in 1909, and these were originally ordered with the stock slots. But before they really could be delivered, Navy changed their mind, and so the slots were filled in on the first frames. Interestingly, the tangent sight remained all throughout production, which kind of seems pointless, but okie dokie. Now, Tokyo was not really game to develop, devote so much of their production line to making these, relatively small contract, and they were building rifles and whatnot, and these uh, revolvers. So, production was set up at Tokyo Gas Electric, and there would be a transition period, and so you'll see all kinds of mix-ups and mismatches, uh, really. The Tokyo Artillery Arsenal guns are a single-piece frame with these little milled-out panels for lightning cuts, and the earliest Tokyo Gas Electric, TGE, would be built using these frames. But when TGE started doing their own, they would simplify production by actually going to a two-piece frame where they would machine them and then join them together very quite well, very pinned together. And they would not have these panels on the side. It would just be smooth here. Hmm, I don't know. Uh, there would be a second Navy contract when World War I kicked off for 2500 Again, from Tokyo Gas Electric. It's unknown if all 4,000 were delivered to the Japanese Navy. Some say that maybe only 36, 3,700 were actually delivered. We don't really know. Several hundred, maybe even a couple of thousand, were also private purchased by 
army officers who, I guess, just didn't want to carry a revolver. This was kind of new technology for that damn time, and to be fair, quite a nice gun for an early generation automatic. Keep in mind that it took several iterations of the Borchard Luger before it was ready for prime time, too. And it did have a safety at least. It does balance well, easily detaching mag, some type of a hold open, although that could be improved. And the 8mm cartridge was adequate. Kind of reminds me of maybe 9 by 18 Makarov today. A little more than 32 or 380, but nothing like 45 or even uh, 7.65 Parabellum, 9mm Parabellum. But then again, these early automatics were all kind of, yeah. You know, but it was also very expensive and time-consuming to produce, even the slightly simplified TGE guns. And so production numbers remained quite low. And uh, interest was quite low. Outside of the Navy, you just had a handful of contracts. In fact, the only Papa Nambus that would still have the stocks, or stock slots, would be a handful sold to Siam. All the rest should, uh, should not have stock slots, either originally filled in or never on the frame. So what can I say about the Papa Nambu, the 1902? Well, it was very well crafted. And for better or worse, it was essentially the brainchild of Kaijiro Nambu alone. Maybe a little bit of teamwork would have helped, because one of the big downfalls to me is disassembly. I know it's an early gun. Early guns are always kind of a little funky for disassembly. But this one is particularly weird. And uh, I'm not going to do it because uh, I don't want to, and it's difficult and frustrating. Um, if you want to see someone mess with it, you can check out CN Arsenal, and even Othias cannot seem to get it on the first go, and I know that feeling. So if he doesn't have a prayer, what do I have? I have taken it apart before. It's just some days it'll come apart and go together easy. Other days uh, it fights you, and I'm just not wanting to risk it because there's enough things that could get lost or broken pass. Again, check out CN Arsenal. They at least do it. I'm good. You know, the 8mm cartridge, one thing I'll say about it, it's smooth shooting and quite accurate. But, you know, it is kind of wimpy. And my thoughts as to why, the locking system in this gun is, is perfectly durable. It could handle probably 9mm Luger, maybe even 45. I think part of it is the asymmetrical recoil system, because you have a spring only on one side, and you have that firing pin tail only on one side. I think that might have something to do with it, at least in theory. I'm not sure. I think it might have also just been, you know, they weren't sure what it could really put up with. Again, no manual safety, except for the grip safety. When this works well, it's fine, but these somehow easily break or lose their springs. And the uh, rear sight, these can easily get loose. And really just seem unnecessary without the uh, without the stock. Not a bad first effort, but it was awfully expensive for what it was. And it only saw the limited use by the Navy, with most Navy guns being either partial or full TGE. That said, the Tokyo Arsenal would keep these in production in limited numbers occasionally. Up until 1903, excuse me, 1923, the Great Kanto Earthquake where all production stopped. And then things get all kinds of muddled again in the 1920s as the last ones are put together. The last ones seem to be in the 8,000 to 9,000 serial range and were probably for the army for private purchase. And there's a mix of Tokyo and TGE markings. It's a whole thing. Don't know. One more name for this is the Type A or Nambu Type A. That's because there was also, of course, the Type B. When I got into Japanese guns, you could still pick up a Papa, not a Grandpa, but a Papa, for not crazy money. More than a Type 14, but less. But even then, the Babies, or the Type Bs, were expensive, and they have remained as such. In fact, this was a whale gun of mine, if you will, for uh, many, many years. Now... It's interesting because right about the time the original grandpa went into production, 
design work began on the baby. So it seems like something that Nambu always kind of had in the back of his mind. And these were put into limited production as early as 1904, but production numbers were very low until about 1908. And interestingly, the first uh, 400 to 450 Type Bs, or babies, or as it was known in Japan, the small type Nambu pistol, they had a lot of grandpa features. They had the wooden base plate magazine. They had the more grandpa style um, charging handle. And uh, they even had a thinner diameter firing pin. The firing pin was strengthened, made thicker. The charging handle and floor plate were made the papa style. <clears throat> and uh, that's when we get the kind of this modernized type here. And that's the one that was put into mass production by 1909 at Tokyo Arsenal. And I say mass production kind of loosely. The Army did trial these and did approve them for private purchase, but as you'd imagine, never, uh, never adopted them because, yeah, this is a adorable little gun, but not really a battlefield pistol. <laughs> This is about a two-thirds scale Papa Nambu. It has a three and a quarter inch barrel and an overall length of about six and three quarter inches. And it's quite lightweight. It a little, just a little bit under a pound and a half. And the babiness extends to the inside. This uses the same style of magazine, but it only holds seven cartridges. And this is a new cartridge. This is 7 by 20 Nambu. It's a scaled down bottleneck round. This is equivalent to 32, although probably a little bit weaker than the Browning cartridge, which is funny because, believe it or not, this is actually a locked breech gun. You would think it'd just be a blowback like, say, a 1900 or 1903 or 1910. Nope. It is locked breech. There is zero reason for this. You can argue about the, the papa if it needs to be, but there is no reason the baby needs to be. Yet it is because I think these were just status symbol guns. That's why when you do find them, they're usually in pretty good shape. They even tend to have their matching mags because these were private purchased by wealthy and or high ranking officers. These were sold at the PX, as I've called it before, the Japanese Army Store. And uh, they would cost about twice as much as a Browning or uh, a broom handle or about anything else. And in fact, they were quite a bit more expensive than Japanese domestic designs because they were subsidized and the Type B was not. So high-ranking officers wanted these. Rich people wanted them. It was a desk gun. It is lightweight. It is compact, and at close range, a 7mm bullet will be okay. Notice it does have a fixed lanyard ring, and it does have the fixed rear sights. But it's a curiosity. It's cool. Extremely well made, but very much unnecessary. It almost seems like it was a kind of a vanity project of Kaiser and Ambu, if I'm being honest with you. But... Really, by the time it went into mass production, he was long transferred away from Tokyo Arsenal. But they would produce them in small batches before and during and after World War I. So that kind of gets us to the 1920s. How many were built? Well, for the Papa, the number 4600 for Tokyo is often repeated. As for TGE, it's often said 56 to 5,700, which would give us a total of around 10,200 to 10,300. The only thing is observable serials only seem to go up to about 9,300, although it's entirely possible the last run could have been um, sent somewhere else or that serial numbers overlapped between the two factories. It's also possible that they didn't build that many because, again, records are all lost. So best guesstimate, 9 to 10,000 Papas were built. The majority were built before the Great Kanto Earthquake, although a final run was done using existing parts and assemblies as late as uh, the late 1920s. 
and in maybe even into the 1930s because there still were not enough Type 14s and the war in China was really picking up. As for the Bebe, these were predominantly made by Tokyo with production between 1909 and 1923. And there would be another small run after they were starting to recover from the Kanto earthquake using up parts. There were also some five to 600 assembled by TGE in the 1920s, meaning that uh, they're pretty rare. So total at Tokyo, about 6,000. And so people estimate around 6,500 total were built. So not a huge number less than the full size, but yet they're much more prized and harder to find because uh, probably most of them were never captured by Americans and brought home. It's a thing. And they were in use by World War II, but... Yeah, you can understand why it wasn't really a weapon of war. People weren't typically raiding offices, and yeah, this wasn't something you were going to find on the battlefield. As far as the Papa, you know, the Navy kept theirs in service until finally replacing them with the Type 14. And uh, the Army had some private purchase, and these would turn up in World War II in battlefields. And uh, many more were on the home islands, plus again, there were several so to Siam and elsewhere. So it was a bit of a success. All told, you know, 15, 16,000 of the two were, were built. But this was only the beginning because, of course, now we can come to the gun that most people identify with Nambu that bears his name, but actually isn't really attributable to him, if you're being honest. We come to the most famous Japanese pistol, and rightly so. It was the uh, the most produced by, uh, by a long strip, the Type 14, named for the 14th year of the reign of the Taisho or Taisho Emperor, which was 1925 when it was adopted. But very few were actually made that year because he would uh, he would pass. The next year in 1926, so actual production will begin in the next reign of Hirohito, which was known as the Showa era, beginning with the same year, Showa 1, although that was only like a month or even a few days. And it is often called the Nambu, and it started off as such. As uh, the second naval contract kicked out for the Papa Nambu, by 1916, Nam Nambu himself, Kaiser Nambu, who was quickly rising in the ranks of the military, set out to strengthen, simplify, improve, streamline for mass production his pistol. And he would work on and off for years. But in 1922, he was promoted to Lieutenant General and kind of put in charge of the Tokyo artillery arsenal. So his time was limited. And then in 1924, he would retire. So his improved, simplified design was mostly ready to go, but not quite. So in 1924 and in 1925, his work was continued by a committee, which had a couple of members that were his direct understudies and uh, protégés. And this had mixed results, if I'm being honest. But nevertheless, the pistol was ready and was adopted, tested, and the earliest date pistol we have today is dated 15.11. Now, the 15 is the 15th year, so 1926, of the reign of the Taisho Emperor, and 11 is for the 11th month, November. That won't change. But once he passed the next month, his son took over, and the last little bit of 1926 was uh, Showa 1 for Hirohito's reign. Therefore, there basically are no pistols known to be made in you know, one point, whatever. The first ones were delivered to the military for field testing and trials in uh, Showa 2, which was 1927. And the first runs, the production was first set up at a new factory at Chiguza, which was under Nagoya supervision. It actually would not be until mid 1928 that the Tokyo Arsenal would ramp up its production 
for the pistol. But these would be very low numbers first years. So let's talk about it a bit and then we'll get into some of the history and compare it to the Papa. Dimensionally, we're about the same. A hair under two pounds. Overall length, just, just right at nine inches. A barrel, a little under 4.7, it's about 4.65, give or take inches. And still have the attaching eight round magazine. It's not interchangeable with the Papa, but very similar. Uh, same striker system in principle, same locking system. Interestingly, we've returned to a fixed lanyard ring like we saw in the Grandpa versus the folding on the Papa. And we've got a much simplified cocking handle system. In fact, all of disassembly is much simplified. Everything is. We have serrated lined grips as opposed to checkered. We have a lined magazine here. It is still nickeled which is neat. This isn't stainless steel, it's actually nickeled metal, which makes it very smooth. But that would kind of come back to bottom in the butt in a way. And single action, striker fired, still firing the 8x22 Nambu cartridge. But we do have many, many changes and many things that streamline and simplify production. For one, we've gone to a, a much more practical fixed rear sight. There's our cocking handle, it's much more simplified. But here we have that safety. Now, if this seems like it was kind of tacked on, and this is one of the things that is criticized about this design, because you cannot really effectively reach it with your finger and activate it, you can kind of push it off a little bit but yeah it's because it was added last minute by the committee nambu had been considering what to do but hadn't really gotten around for it yeah we don't have the grip safety anymore eh, it works I mean, it is a safety it met the requirements but one thing that was really nice they did notice the back we don't have that rod this actually has dual recoil springs one on each side, meaning it is stronger and more symmetrical. Now the firing pin tail to work with the new springs is actually on the bottom now. It's still slightly off center, but it's not totally thrown off to the side. Still have that last round hold open that slams forward when we remove our mag. And these have very respectable triggers. And while they maybe don't have quite as nice of a blue job as some pre-World War I guns, it's still a high-grade blue at this time with hand-lacquered wood grips and uh, overall very nice machining. And in fact, the system was felt to be so much sturdier that in 1929, the Japanese military began loading a hotter version of the 8x22 cartridge, which delivered about a hundred mm, foot-pounds per second more velocity out of the muzzle. It was originally a little under a thousand, and this was well over a thousand, so it helps. About 10% improvement in the speed and everything. I'm not sure if they could have pushed it any further or not, but yeah, they started loading a hot around. And so things were, uh, things were looking good. We have two factories building these. One under Nagoya, Chiyuza, and we have Tokyo, who's obviously, you know, establishing themselves. And these started to ship over to China. They were issued to NCOs and some low-ranking officers, but still at this time, Japanese were expected to private purchase their guns. I have two examples here. This is uh, early, early, yeah, 1930. And this is uh, late, early, 1936. And there are some differences. After they were in the field, there was the Great Recall, which was in 1932, which was Showa 7. 
that's because they were having problems. They added a magazine disconnect safety, a little bit haphazardly, because people were dropping the mags out of their pistols, because this was a drop-free mag, and not realizing they were still around in the chamber. Keep in mind, don't laugh at them, for a lot of Japanese, this was the first automatic pistol they were ever acquainted with. So it's a mistake that you could, you could excuse, frankly. But it led to potentially accidents and death, so they added that. Another thing had to do with the, something that would continue to be a weak point in the design. The firing pin, striker, and tail or guide system, which is a, this is a two-piece design with a spring. The original firing pin was 86 millimeters. That was reduced to about 73. And the original tail or part striker we guide back here was about 35 millimeters and that was increased to about 47. And that was hoped to improve because they were having problems with firing pin breakages. They were also having trouble with uh, people dropping their mags out and losing them. That's why these early guns very often do not have their matching mags anymore. Or if they do, it's usually the spare mag. So there was the Great Recall. And then, in late summer, August of 1932, the Kokora Arsenal would begin Type 14 production under Tokyo supervision. And just a few months later, the Chiguza Arsenal under Nagoya supervision, or Chiguza Factory, I should say, under Nagoya Arsenal supervision, would stop making these guns by the end of that year. They only built about 7,800. But just a year later, at the end of 1933, a new factory would begin manufacturing these from an old friend. Now, after he retired from the military, General Nambu opened up his own rifle factory by 1927 and began supplying heavy and light machine guns, even some submachine guns eventually. And he got the contract at his Hakibenji factory and began making these in 1933 at the, at the end of that year. He would actually pick up his factory pickup right where Chihuza would leave off, so roughly serial number 78. 101. Just like Chiguza, this was under Nagoya supervision. And also, for those that know history, at this time, Tokyo Arsenal is going away. So Kokora would finally get inspection rights and start inspecting their own pistols. And by early 1935, so Showa 10, they would use up the remainder of the Tokyo parts. But since Kokora continued to use the stacked cannonballs, like Tokyo, yeah, it's kind of the continue on. But not for long. In mid-1936, Kokora would uh, build its last Type 14, meaning that by the end of that year, only Nambu's factory was, was building these. And they would continue on a piece. I remove the cocking piece here, just to unscrews, to show you the firing pin system. Now, one improvement that was first introduced at Kokora that would be quickly carried over to Kakibunji would be this flat-sided cutaway striker guide. That's because they were concerned that the original round guide was getting stuck frozen in places like Manchuria over in mainland China. This would not be the only change made to the design, but I thought it was important enough to point out. One thing to know about these Nambus, if you buy them, firing pins and strikers and all that and springs are not interchangeable necessarily from factory to factory. Some are, but as time goes on, yeah, basically just know what you're getting and make sure that it will, uh, that it will work. But yeah, by 1936, Haki Bungie is all alone making Japan's premier service sidearm. No pressure. A couple more tidbits before we move on to the second phase. 
Tokyo and Kokora basically shared the same cereals, and the last recorded cereal from Kokora was roughly 35,400 in essentially a no series block. The Nagoya guns would be in their own block, which is still a no series at this time. There are variations in the lines and the grips. There are some minor variations in the way the magazines are made. There's even man minor variations in the uh, caulking piece in the back and the lanyard loop is a different size slightly. Just little differences from factories. But these all have a high quality blue finish. They, ha they should have the bolt in the white or with a straw color rather. And the small parts like the safety and the trigger and the magazine catch should be in the white or strawed. I should point out too, the magazine catch is not the same as on the Papa. It's a simplified single piece design versus a two piece. The frame is a single piece, but it's a much simpler thing to machine. The trigger is actually riveted in place within the trigger guard. This whole thing, just like on the Papa, pulls out as a unit. But if you need to take your trigger out, you're going to have to break a, uh, a rivet here. So I wouldn't advise doing that. And even after the firing pin improvements, it was still a weak point of the design. Although it did allow it to have a very nice trigger. The part of that was that nice trigger. But uh, with the Tokyo series out and the original Nagoya factory out, we have Kaki Banji, and we're going to stick with him for at least a few years. So let's get into World War II. This is what I consider an well, pre-war pistol or early wartime example. Not much changed for a couple of years. At the end of uh, 19, what would it be, 1938, they would change up the checkering on the caulking knob just a bit. And in the 1939, they would plan some changes. The first of these would come in uh, September. They went to the extended so-called Kiska, or Winter, and Chirian trigger guard here. They just blew it out. It's very iconically Japanese to me. Kind of reminds me of the first bamboos. The next month, October, they went from the grips that were lined all the way to the top to ones where the uh, lines stopped. Personally, I think that's a really good look, but what do I know, right? You know, it's kind of unique, and it saved a little time, too. And then in December of 1939, which would be 14.12, uh, they introduced this spring in the front of the grip. Remember how I said they were having troubles with the mags getting, getting lost here. So the spring meant that even when you press the mag catch, you still had to pull it out. So, now in the beginning, they had the same mag, they just had the cutout in the front. Uh, honestly, these nickel mags that are cut out are relatively uncommon, at least the guns they belong to, because it would not be all that long before they would switch over to a blued magazine, which makes sense. Less elegant, but Saves a lot of effort. In 1940, about a year after all this was done, Hockey Bungie would reach the end of the No Series. They would reach serial number 99,999. They did not want to go into six digits, so they would roll it over to serial number zero and begin Series 1, just like we talked about with the Rosakas. So series one would begin around September, Octo October of 1940, uh, 41, 1941. I had to stop and think there. It's almost as if they knew they were doing something. At the same time, they would ramp up production with Nagoya of supervising a new factory that would soon start up late that year at Toriyamatsu. And they would pick up at series one serial number 50,000. Whereas, uh, excuse me, Kaki Bungie was picking up at series one, serial number zero. So they're kind of splitting that first series. Make sense? 
And this is where, of course, by this point, the war in the Pacific is going on, and we do start to see even more changes. Again, this is uh, 1940 from Kakibunji, and here we have a January 1944 from Toriyamatsu. Toriyamatsu would really ramp up, and in 1942 we would have a couple of changes just to streamline. Like I said, they would uh, go away from the nickel mags. They would also stop having the bolts in the white going to just a blued bolt. And at Kakibunji, that would pretty much be where they would end they would keep making them that way. But Tori and Matsu, they had other ideas. In early 1943, they quit having the heads of the pins sticking out. They would machine them flush with the uh, trigger guard. Faster, easier, and you know, more practical for, for that purpose. The bluing would also kind of go down. They would have these lined grips, kind of their own pattern. Notice they go all the way to the top, unlike the then Boo Factory one. And towards the end of that year, they would finish up their run of the first series and they would begin the second series at Toriyamatsu by the end of 1943. When 1944 dawned, they would introduce changes. That's why I have this one here. One of the most notable is this round cocking knob. It's made from the same blank a metal as this one, but as you can imagine, far fewer steps are required. That one's pretty easy to notice, one that maybe doesn't always get appreciated. The rear sight was greatly simplified. This bridge was shortened, and it was made into a simple just square notch versus kind of a V. Saved machining, saved time, Probably explains why they were cranking these out in such big numbers, right? Took the firing pin and striker out of our Toriyamatsu because essentially from the beginning of their production, they were too trying to fix the firing pin issue, going to an even shorter pin at about 65 millimeters. Interestingly, the guide is back to being the round type. Hmm. Of course, they're not thinking about fighting so much in the uh, you know, cold weather at this point. Anyway, here's the magazine that's blued. That's the loading there. Notice too the kind of grips are duller. They still have a lacquer finish, but it's not the really nice Yoroshi lacquer. It's just a couple of kind of brushed on lacquer things. And the bluing and machining are still acceptable, but very much military grade as we get into 1944. But uh, of course, the worst is yet to come. I should also mention that in 1943, there was a change in policy. Officers were no longer expected to private purchase their guns because of the way the war was going and so many young new officers with no money, they started being issued pistols if they needed one. And finally, they're starting to have enough Type 14s, amongst other pistols, to actually achieve that. So they're, they're cranking these out as fast as they can. And it really starts to show as we get to the end of the year. Around November 1944, they stopped grooving, lining the grips, going to what we refer to as slab grips. This did save time. And you might think this would be a stronger grip, but it's not. These actually crack easier. I have to wonder if the wood was a little just lower quality, or maybe if the grooves actually would stop a crack, you know, before it started traveling so far. Either way, the wood grips are known for being rather delicate. But it was a way to save time. And of course, they would uh, cut down on machining and bluing wherever they could. So these guns by 1945 look pretty rough. So I also uh, should note the, uh, the arc that the safety can leave. It's going to leave one on the frame no matter what. And a lot of these will have it on the wood grips too, or it's been over-rotated. Just kind of part of the design. As we get into 45, we just get rougher fit and finish. But they're still, they're still usable. 
That is, at least until June, July of 1945, when the so-called last-ditch guns start. And these are exactly what you think. They are assembled from previously rejected parts. They're built using previously damaged, returned guns. Just kind of sweepings off the floor, whatever they can do. And these would, of course, keep being put together until August of 1945, so 20.8. The last known serial from a uh, Toria Matsu pistol is in the second series. It's about 73,290 something. That's the last known. As for Kaki Bungie, the good news is they didn't really change a whole lot from this, except for going to the blued bolt and the simplified magazine and a little bit thinner bluing, hastier. But they would actually stop production August of 1944, sending their remaining frames and parts over to Torimatsu, who would use them a year later in their last ditch guns. They would stop at series one, about serial number 20,000, give or take, maybe a little bit over. So they did not build near as many. That's because they were focusing on our next and final pistol. So let's talk about that, and then we'll have kind of an assessment of Japanese pistols in total. I should say, though, before we move, we don't know how many were built. At least 270 some odd thousand. Some say as many as 300,000. I tend to lean on the side of just over 280,000. So significantly more than what we've seen before. And with that, now, for real, let's move on. And once more, my never-ending quest to redeem Nambu's really last major design, at least mass, last major handgun design, the t Type 94. Unlike previous designs, this is named after the Japanese calendar for the year 2294, excuse me, 2594, oops, and uh, which would be 1934. That was the year he created it and kind of patterned it, and it was put into production in uh, mid-1935. Now, at this point, he's a retired military officer, private citizen as such, and he owns his own factory. But he had recently had a contract for the Type 14, and the government expressed interest in a new gun, partially to address some of the shortcomings of the Type 14, and partially to be cheaper, faster to produce, and smaller, better suited for vehicle crews, uh, pilots, tankers, armored vehicles, just, you know, a more compact gun. So did he succeed? Well, let's first compare to the Type 14. This is over 9 inches long, though just barely, barely, blah. This is just a hair over 7 inches long. Not bad. This has a 4.65 barrel. This has about a 3.75 barrel. So not quite an inch shorter. And whereas this weighs nearly 2 pounds, this weighs around 25 ounces, a hair more than that, but, you know, a pound and a half. So it is lighter, and it is smaller, so that's good. Continuing on with the good, it does fire the standard 8mm round, even the uploaded version introduced in 1929, and for its size, its capacity is adequate. It is a uh, six round box magazine. It does not need the front spring, but it's not strictly speaking 100% drop free either. From the get-go, it had a magazine disconnect safety as well as a much more reasonably placed manual safety versus on the Type 14 because they were both integrated into the design from the beginning versus being shoehorned in. Has fixed notch sights and it has a hammer firing system versus striker. This made it more reliable, dependable, it was less likely to break. It also gave a stronger strike to the, uh, to the primer. So that's good. 
So why do these have such an eh reputation? Well, there are downsides too, of course. For one, it still has the last round hold open only on an empty mag, eject your mag, lose your hold open. I guess Nambu just did not see that as a trouble. Also, the hammer system, while much better, the trigger is not that great. But it, frankly, it's, it's adequate for what it is. Accuracy was acceptable, although not quite as good as with the Type 14. Originally, fit and finish was quite high, although that won't last forever as we'll soon see. And this grip is small for Western hands, or, you know, even anyone in Asia who has bigger hands. But for a compact gun, I mean, look how small even our compact guns are today. So, yeah. This assembly is not that easy. Probably not as hard as on the Papa Dambu, if I'm being completely honest, but not as easy as with the Type 14. And, of course, though, the elephant in the room is, is, is this exposed sear. I've talked about this before. Yes, if it's cocked, it will potentially go off. The thing is, when your safety's on, you cannot press it. If you press it in deep enough to set the gun off, you just broke your safety off. So, that would seem less than unintentional to me. I've said before, most of that jazz about these is kind of, yeah, it's done through what... Uh, GIs kind of came up with. Anyway, there's also some stories that Nambu originally made these for a South American contract. Those don't seem to be true. It does seem like they were made for the military, and it seems like they meet the requirements for size and uh, ease of production and for vehicle crews. So low-rate production would begin in 1935, and for the first, uh, first couple of years, there would not be many changes. Very early on in production, they would add this reinforcing rib to the bottom of the magazine, just so if it dropped, it wouldn't dent as easy. No big deal. Most of them had it. And they would play around with the checkering a bit. Early ones would have real fine checkering. Then they would go to very coarse checkering. And then towards the end of 1937, they would go to kind of the intermediate checkering like you see here. And that would pretty much stay the standard. But in spring of 1940, around Showa 15.4, they would make a pretty big change. The bottom of the frame and whatnot has these cuts here. They would do away with those machining steps. And no one knows exactly why. This is before they really would need to, but they did, and it saved them time. They would also change the tail of the uh, sear here. It kind of sticks up. That would be made more flush back here with later guns. That's a little more understandable, frankly. Just eliminating machining steps. Of course, the uh, change would continue on the side here. It does add a little bit of weight, you can notice. And I will say one major reason could be that in 1940, show a 15 the orders from the government were stepped up before that pretty low rate most of them going to china if not naval pilots but maybe that was just something they did to try to keep up with the increased production because these were only produced at the cocky bungee factory who was of course also making type 14s that said the quality of bluing was still very high the small parts, like the trigger, were still strawed. We still had the nickeled magazine. And that all would continue until World War II was underway. The first thing to go would be the nickeled magazine, switching over to blued at the beginning of 1942. But, of course, as the war would go on, more and more shortcuts would be taken. I want to make one more comparison before we get into the War II. Bringing back out the baby, the Type B, because this kind of seems like the you know, spiritual forerunner of this gun and what maybe Nambu was working on in a way, because they are a lot similar, but also this is a much better design. And really overall length is about the same. The, the 94 is over 7 inches because of how the grip kind of sweeps back, 
whereas the baby is technically about six three quarters, six point eight. But really, in practice, they're about the same. The baby is lighter at about 23 ounces, and this one's a little over 25, so two to three ounces more weight, which, not bad. But the barrel is where we really see something nice. This is three and a quarter. This is three and three quarters. So we get a half inch longer barrel on the 94. That matters because whereas the baby fires the weak seven millimeter cartridge, this is firing the full power eight millimeter cartridge, which, okay, is a little wimpy by modern standards, but hey, at least it's the standard round. And we're only losing one cartridge. If I can get this out here, I'm gonna sit you down just for a second so I don't wrestle. There we go. We have seven of the little rounds in this, and we have six of the eight mil here. So that seems like a very good trade-off to me. So to my mind, it seems like Nambu always kind of had making a small gun in the back of his head. And with this, he got a lot more writer. And the Japanese government seemed to agree because in 1942 and 43, they would again increase their orders. Here we have a mid-war example. This is an odd gun that I've never really gotten a firm answer on because it has wood grips. It should have polymer, but they're really nice wood grips, so I'm not sure what the story is on this one. It's kind of odd. In 1943, the bluing would start to slowly but surely degrade to truly a, a, a military grade. And they would stop strawing the small parts. Trigger. Of course, by this time, we have... Such a again. Like I said, these aren't really drop-free mags as such, and this one sticks. We have uh, a blued mag here, but notice it still has the original style. A little bit of denting on this one. That's probably why it's a little sticky. So they've gone to the blued mag, and overall, the thing here is just the quality goes down. But production numbers still stay relatively high throughout 1943 and into 1944. Now, when I was talking about the Type 14, I said in August of that year, they stopped making those to focus on the Type 94. And around that time, 19.7, 19.8, 19.9, so late summer, the slab wood grips replaced the plastic. And unlike the wood grips for the Type 14, these are actually quite durable because they're very just chunks of wood. For a minute, that was the only major change, aside from, again, the quality going down. In fact, it got so low at the end of 1944 that there had to be a bit of a mix-up at the factory, a shake-up, because the inspectors were just weren't happy. So sometimes you can find the roughest machined Type 94s made at the end of 1944. 1945 would see some further simplifications. So-called square back would appear in January, February of that year along with simplified bump rear sights. Compared to these earlier ones. And the bluing is certainly military grade at best. But actually the quality would get slightly better at the beginning of 1945. They would also go to a larger lanyard ring. Not entirely sure why. And there would be a little bit of difference in the um, safety as well. Hard to probably see on camera. But they would change the safety just a wee bit. This is a potentially fragile part, at least over all the years. I've seen some broken or worn out safeties and people messing with them. Hard to say if something is a natural break or if someone goofed it. They would also simplify the magazine. Aside from just being a coarser fit and finish, they would go to a simple button is the loading. So late magazines, you can, uh, you can easily tell. Production would continue, the standard production, until June 
1945, at which time the so-called Last Ditch series would take over, so 20.6. Like with the Type 14, these were built with rejected parts, reworked guns, yada, yada, yada. And by July, the uh, Kakibanji factory was essentially out of work. Um, they were gone. They quit making 94s. So the last one of these are in, uh, in June. This is a relatively late one, all things considered. There is another variation that appeared in uh, May of 1945, 20.5, so very briefly, before the last ditch. This is called a short grip. They actually move the screw up, but those are rather uncommon, so I don't have one to show you. Again, with this one and these wood grips, if anyone knows anything, I assume some kind of nicely made American aftermarket but, um, yeah, whoever made these put some care and time. They really fit the gun exceedingly well. This came to me through a guy years ago. Didn't pay much for it, so this kind of, it's even inlet for the mag catch over here. I don't know. This kind of seemed odd to me, and I didn't want to sell it till I knew exactly what it was or wasn't. So that's the uh, Type 94. They were encountered a lot, and it's a pretty common bring back. As to how many were built, again, only Kaki Bungie would build these. It was over 70,000 and 72,000 or less, so kind of gives you that range. Over 70, less than 72-ish. So only about one of these for every, or one of these for every four Type 14s built, but still about 10,000 more than the Type 26 and lots more than the Papa and Baby Nambu at least. So, final thoughts on Japanese handguns. And at the end, here we are, back with them all spread out. You know, the, the first guns for the early generations really showed promise. Well, the baby was probably a bit of a fool's errand, if I'm being honest. But, you know, it was a commercial gun, almost a kind of a badge of thing. The, the Type 4, the Papa, the 1902 modified, the Type A... It just needed one more pass. It's just a shame that the Type 14 didn't come along sooner. I really like the Type 14. I think it has a lot of potential. Again, again, it has one of the best triggers of a military gun I've ever come across. And it's actually quite accurate and very light recoiling. And the 8mm cartridge, especially the, uh, the powered-up version after 1929, is better. But still kind of weak for what it is, but better. Keep in mind that Italy used 380 and even 32, so mm, it's a handgun. Japan's attitude towards the handgun being kind of a badge of office or last line of defense might explain that too a lot. The only problem is that firing pin, that striker system, was never really perfected. And then, of course, as the war went on, the quality got pretty, pretty rough. All but the very last ones were perfectly safe. They just didn't look pretty or work you know, smoothly. Now, one's made in July or August of 1945. Eh, all bets are off, man. I don't know. But it was Japan's most mass-produced and most iconic pistol, and where most people know the name Nambu, even though he actually helped with well over a dozen other guns or even outright designed them. Unfortunately, the Type 94 is still quite infamous, and that's almost entirely undeserved. Yes, the sear is on the outside. It's not the only gun to do that. That was because it was designed to meet a weight, size, and cost requirement limitation from the government. So he designed it for their needs. And there are no records of accidents. There are more accidents with the Type 14 early on than there were with the Type 94. Keep in mind it does have the uh, magazine disconnect safety and a very decent thumb safety. Not the best. A firing pin block would be better, but it is hammer fired, not striker. And that really addressed a lot of issues. And I think compared to the earlier baby, it, it's it's really, it's a shame it's underappreciated. And I've said that before, and I'm sure I'll say it in past videos. It's also a shame that the 1944 guns in particular kind of give it a bad rep because man, some of them are rough as a corn cob. But the early ones from the 30s and even 1940, 41, 42, they're very attractive, com almost commercial-grade guns in some instances. 
Uh, so I think that needs to be taken into consideration. Seventy to seventy-two thousand, not a huge number, but when you can, you know, kind of combine it with the Type 14, that means that Japan had roughly three hundred and fifty thousand handguns. Again, a drop in the bucket compared to what the U.S. produced or Russia, but compared to what they've made before, less than a hundred thousand all types and totals. They did ramp up. And up until recently, you could still pick legitimate GI bring back Battlefield pickup styles for not crazy money. What I really like about Japanese guns, they haven't been, for the most part, refurbished, reblued, reworked. The majority do not have import marks. I've seen a few that came out of like China or Thailand that were import marked early on, but the majority do not. So these are authentic. These are right off the battlefield. And if this were a Luger, you know what that would be worth. If this were a Tokarev, those things are going for pretty good money these days. But for some reason, the Nambus are still a bit of a sleeper, which is why I have several. If they were Luger price, I'd have like two. But, like I said, events out of my control happened recently. If you checked out my video over on the personal Misha channel, you know what happened. And uh, those other things kind of needing a little break. But we'll be back to shooting videos. I got three or four new guns to, to bring out. Kind of waiting on those to come in anyway. Plus it's still really hot outside. So with that, we revisited one of my favorites. And uh, I hope after this week you've maybe gained a little bit of an appreciation too. Or maybe at least help cure your insomnia. If you could, either way, like, share, and subscribe. Please do comment. And if you'd like to help support the channel, please check out the link to the Patreon. This is Misha, and I'll catch you with hopefully more exciting content very soon next time.